Good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, back from uh, what was a, a kind of a summer break for people. Um, and this, uh, um, and thank you for all of you for making time this morning and uh, Fridays. This today's session is an exciting way to kick off this academic year. It's called "Asking, Listening, and Doing What Matters in Kidney Care," keeping our focus, as we always do, very much centered um, on. Uh, people living with kidney disease. This is a group presentation by a number of people and I'll just give a brief introduction uh, about each of them um, while this slide is up. So Cassie Mitchell is from the BC Patient Safety Quality Council and she joined that group in October of 2018. Uh, she's both a patient and a healthcare provider and became involved in the um, as a patient partner and part of the oversight and advisory committee. She's got a master's degree in health and a diploma in gerontology. So welcome Kate Cassie and thanks very much for sharing your thoughts. Ruhi Mardani is also from the BC Patient Safety Quality Council and joined that group in March 2020 as a project coordinator for the public and patient engagement team. She also brings a wealth of experience in terms of quality improvement, patient engagement and Indigenous health to her role in the council when she finished her Master of Public Health in Social and Behavioral Sciences at U of T where she specialized in Indigenous health. Uh, Ruhi moved here from Ontario and was very excited uh, to call herself now a Vancouverite. Terence Chan, many of you know, he's our patient partner from the Chinese Renal Association, uh, has come from Hong Kong since 1993 and is a committee member of the Chinese Renal Association since 2014. He has a kidney disease due to a family history caused by from IGA and received a kidney transplant from a, his wife, a living donor, in May of 2014. He still works at a his own business, which is construction and restoration services, and is active promoting organ donation and awareness for kidney diseases in the Chinese community. And Lois Neufeld from Interior Health is a nurse with 35 years experience. She was introduced to dialysis care working in ICU in Edmonton and her nursing journey has brought her now through to a manager role um, for uh, the PRH program about 10 years ago. And last but not least to complete our uh, group of speakers is Janice Ratinsky from Island Health and she is a registered nurse currently part of the management team for renal services at Island Health and has taken a personal interest in ensuring that people that she's in contact with have their needs met. So this topic is near and dear to all of our hearts um, and I'm really excited to share your experiences and thoughts with the broader renal community that are on the call now. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and the Métis Charter Community of the Lower Mainland Region. And all of you are um, similarly um, hearing this or speaking from your territories. Next slide. So the objective for this session are to actually apply the WMU, the What Matters to You, um, in daily conversations and routine patient care. It's something that many of us have talked about or know about, but really codifying it and um, socializing it. So it's really the core of what we do is an important um, component of this. We need to understand what matters most when we set goals for patients and uh, between health professionals and patients and for ourselves personally. And we also wanted to explore the cultural considerations of having what matters to you conversations in the context of kidney care. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to our first speaker. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to join today's round. My name is Kathy Mitchell, and I'm an engagement leader at the BC Patient Safety and Policy I'm presenting this morning from Prince, George, sorry, from Prince George, which means that I get to live, work and play on the traditional territory of the Clay Lake A, and that means people where the two rivers flow. And for those not super familiar with the North, those two rivers would be the Nechaco and Fraser River. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ruhi. I'm a project coordinator at the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. And I'm joining in from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Tooth Nations here in Vancouver. And I'm uh, happy to be here. And um, we'd also just like to declare at the start of our presentation that we have no conflict of interest. 
So the aim of our presentation today is to invite you to have what matters to you conversations with patients, family members and caregivers. And I'm just going to ask Sidonia if she can open up the chat box. So the chat box will just be open for this slide only. And we really wanted to start you thinking about and to reflect on what matters to you in your own healthcare. So if you're comfortable doing so, please can you share your thoughts in the chat? And we'll just give you maybe 60 seconds um, just to be able to add in any comments. So if we have anyone joining by phone only, then I will read out some of the things that are coming up in the chat. So we have Danny, who's commented that genuine lines of communication between patients and healthcare providers is important. And Andira has Andira for his comments. And we have respect up as well. And then as a transplant recipient, my voice matters. As the saying goes, nothing about me without me. So yeah, thank you, Randy, for sharing that. Um, I know we don't have too long to keep the chat box open, and I thank those that have put their comments in. As you can see, it's just really important to reflect on the differences in what matters to people when receiving care. We're unique individuals, and what might be important to one person may not be the priority for someone else. And that's really just this little activity was just to get people reflecting on and thinking about. So if we can move to the next slide. So what matters to you day started in Norway in 2014 with the simple goal of encouraging meaningful conversations between patients, caregivers and their families and their healthcare providers. From Norway, it expanded to Scotland, Brazil and beyond. And we now have more than 30 countries participating in the initiative, including BC. Participation in our province is supported through a partnership between the Patient Voices Network, the BC Patient Safety Quality Council and other provincial partners such as BC Renal. Providing person and family centred care is important because it results in better outcomes for patients and greater satisfaction for care. Asking what matters to you supports this by putting the patient voice at the centre of care by focusing on what really matters to that particular person. Now more than ever in these unique, constantly changing times, what matters to you is of great importance to both patients and to care providers. Next slide, please. What matters to you is a three-step process. Ask what matters, listen to what matters, and do what matters. The first step in beginning a conversation is to ask, what matters to you? Sometimes this question may not be the right fit, so we encourage you to make it your own and adapt it to the context in which you work. There are many different ways to ask this question. What is important to you at the moment? What would you like to achieve as a result of our work together today? What can I do to best support you in your care today? It's important to foster open communication and support patients to speak honestly and directly by establishing an empathetic relationship, understanding the person in their context of their life, making time and space for questions. Asking what matters to you is also about deep listening in order to understand what is being communicated. Some active, technique, active listening techniques may include asking open-ended questions, clarifying the meaning, allowing for pauses and paraphrasing, Nonverbal communication is equally important, and you might want to consider your body posture, facial expression, and eye contact when speaking with patients, families, and caregivers. And importantly, ask, it's not just about asking and listening to what matters, but we must also act upon what we hear if it is appropriate and embed their wishes into care preferences. It's all about a partnership in care. Once you have a better understanding of your patient's wants and needs, you will want to embed their, care, their preferences into care planning and create a space for true partnership in care. Next slide, please. 
We understand that while we attempt to achieve a well-rounded perspective in relation to what matters to you, we also realize the, the need to invite others to provide a lens on this work. Through our partnership and collaboration with the First Nations Health Authority, we were able to reach out to the Acting Director of Quality to discuss cultural considerations related to having these conversations and ensuring global accessibility to the process. This is a time of reflection and we need to recognize that racism happens and is currently happening. Recently, the Black Lives Matter move and other racialized movements have created an increased awareness. When working with some of these populations, what matters to them needs to be packaged in this context. It becomes real when we start to recognize this. Practicing cultural safety and cultural humility goes a long way in establishing relationship and building trust. Cultural humility is a process of self-reflection to understand personal and systemic biases and to develop and maintain respectful processes and relationships based on mutual trust. Cultural humility involves humbly acknowledging oneself as a learner when it comes to understanding another's experience. Many populations may not be used to having their voice heard and may not be expected, expecting this question or trusting of the healthcare system. It is really important to be mindful of that. The core features of what matters to you are dignity and respect and recognition of identity. Continue to recognize and remember that folks are more than just their healthcare concern. And there is a need to address the power imbalances within healthcare. Ultimately, it's about two human beings having a connection and it's important to show care for the person themselves versus focusing on their condition or viewing them as simply a care card number. Next slide, please. So we wanted to address some of the concerns that have been expressed around asking the what matters to you question. Firstly, is that it might take too much time. So while time pressure is a major challenge in providing care, research shows that patients only usually need about 90 seconds or fewer at the beginning of a conversation to state their concern. Asking what matters to you can also save time in the long run by strengthening the provider-patient relationship, which can in fact make care more efficient. Next slide, please. The other concern um, in relation to addressing this is that you might not have the solution to every patient's response, but just being given the opportunity to talk about what matters to you can help patients feel heard and contribute to building relationships and trust, trust, whether you can act on everything or not. Discussions may also highlight opportunities to connect patients with other community resources and to make referrals elsewhere. In setting the context and grounding ourselves in what is happening globally with systemic racism, you may not always have a solution to what a patient shares with you, but it is important to recognize it and acknowledge gaps in the system, as well as identify the needs and what is important to your patient, their family, and their caregivers. Sometimes it's just the art of active listening that can help to build that relationship and trust. Next slide, please. A multiple case study evaluation from Scotland identified the following enablers to asking what matters to you. Adopting a flexible and non-prescriptive approach, combining what matters to you with some of your other work, it doesn't need to be an add-on activity. Keep it simple. Keep track of the impact being made, so through patient satisfaction levels, improvements in safety and quality of care, and to feel supported in this approach by peers and your organizational leadership all act as enablers. Next slide, please. There are many ideas on how to embed the question into different care settings. Uh, including acute care, primary care, residential, and community care. Some examples of embedding the question in a, the acute care setting could be included in the pre-admission process, inquiring at admission, documenting it on charts, creating visual reminders such as head of bed posters or whiteboards, and embedded in discharge planning. Ways to include the question in primary care or to include it in the pre-appointment questionnaire discussing it at the start of the appointment and integrate it when planning treatment together. You could include it in residential care by including it on intake forms, uh, integrating it into care plan planning and care conferences and create visual reminders such as artwork or posters. And you could embed the question into community care by including it in, on consultation forms, documenting it on charts and identifying it on treatment plans. 
Next slide, please. So through our website, social media and newsletters, we have been able to highlight both patient partner and healthcare partner what matters to you stories. We're also seeing patient partners being invited to present to care providers on what is important to them in their own healthcare. One example of this was a, a diverse group of patient partners sharing their stories with the UHMBC Physician Initiative Committee earlier this year. Northern Health Authority has also developed an online module grounded in person and family centered care. And that was after they worked with a family member to explore what was important to her following her husband's care journey. And prior to COVID, we also had um, information booths being set up by both patient partners and healthcare partners throughout their home communities and within hospital facilities, physician offices to further promote this initiative. Um, we're also seeing health authorities now um, using what matters to you to assist with goal setting um, for patients in acute care. So this question is being trialled on communication boards, which are at the patient's bedside. And on June 9th, we proclared, um, BC proclared June 9th, sorry, is what matters to you day. So despite COVID, there has been some work happening across the province this year. Um, next slide, please. So as I touched upon, we do have a shift in how we promote what matters to you in light of a pandemic. And here are some considerations for what matters to you and virtual health. So continue to create the space for these conversations during all virtual interactions. Relationships can still be maintained virtually. You may just need to be more mindful of your communication skills, both verbal and non-verbal. Person and family centered care continues to be the philosophy on what care interactions are based upon. So dignity and respect, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. This can all happen virtually and leads to better health, health outcomes, improved patient and family experiences, and better clinical and staff satisfaction. Also offer choices in how to be seen. Telephone versus virtual visits. What's your patient's comfort level with technology? And be mindful that there is a digital divide. Um, you can also look at providing supports with technology. This could include a how-to guide or a one-pager for patients. And an, an example of this is that doctors of BC have created a patient experience video that's around 90 seconds long and um, its aim was to increase confidence in using Zoom as a virtual platform for their patients. And then when your patient is booking an appointment, have them prepared for the question. For example, have them advised to think about what matters to them, what would they like to know about during that appointment, and what do they need in order to feel comfortable and safe on their care journey. Next slide, please. Every year in June, we celebrate International What Matters to You Day. But truly, every day is an opportunity to incorporate what is important to patients and their families into the care planning process. If you would like to participate, we've created a number of resources to help you promote the initiative, which can be downloaded from our website and include posters, bookmarks, buttons, and videos. If you have a great conversation, we would also love to hear about it, and you can submit your story through our website. Next slide, please. As we wrap up, it is important to understand why you are asking what matters to you and how in turn you can respond to your patients. So we're going to open up the chat box and I ask you to reflect in the chat box and tell us, do you feel comfortable and prepared to have the what matters to you conversations? And for us, what additional supports can we provide you with? I know we're running out of time here, so we will make sure to take note of what comes into the chat box as you reflect over the next minute or two. Next slide, please. Just wanted to say thank you so much for having us and feel free to reach out to us with any questions at what matters to you at bcpsqc.ca. So I, I believe yeah, the next speaker is Terence, so we'll hand it over to you, Terence. Thank you. Uh, I'm Terence Chance. Um, I'm so happy at Chance to dance uh, this meeting. Um, I'm a Chinese uh, immigrant uh, from Hong Kong since uh, 1993. Um, I have kidney diseases and it is the family history. 
um, since I'm a young boy, and the cause of that is uh, MGA, and also hypertension that caused the problem of uh, kidney diseases. Um, this is my experience. And um, also, um, today I'm happy life as normal because I have a kidney transplant. And uh, my wife is a living donor. Um, thanks to her, and she gave me a new life. Uh, besides that, I'm a committee member of Chinese Renal Association, which is a chapter of Kidney Foundation of Canada, BC and Yogon branch. Um, they do get a lot of information for me and to support our Chinese Renal Association. As a patient, um, my kidney disease patient, um, my perspective for myself personally, I think the most important um, my history is that uh, is my my job, my work, and most my business. No matter I have a kidney diseases or I'm not a kidney disease person, I need to have a job to earn my living. And also, of course, now I need to support my family. So I'm very concerned about my job, my business. No matter um, how it's going, I need to support it. Of course, the second point is that I'm much concerned about is my family. Uh, right now, my wife, um, she gives a new life for me, and also now is to add her kids. Of course, like 10 years ago, um, my kids still young, still study in elementary schools or high school. So this is what I'm mostly concerned, no matter now or when they are young. And the third point I'm much concerned about is my daily activities. As mentioned, I'm still working. So I need to drive to different job sites, no matter in downtown, in Richmond, in Burnaby, or even in some suburbs or countryside. Because I like driving, I want to keep on that way because I like to visit. I like to go to different places, more like an adventure. I enjoy it. I want to keep it as a hobby, no matter if it's a kid disease patient or not. I want to keep on going like that way. I don't want to destroy it. Uh, as I remember around 2010 or 2011, uh, thanks to Kidney Clinic, thanks to St. Paul Hospital, um, the nurse, the doctor, the specialist, at that time, he told me that my GFR is going down a lot. I need to prepare for a diagnosis. And of course, at that time, 2010 and 11, I have a symptom uh, for kidney diseases, like swollen leg, itchy skin, um, can't sleep well, like this kind of things come out, uh, make me not a very good feeling. And stuff at that time, I want to express my feeling to, uh, to talk to the nurse. But of course, thanks to um, Singapore because that time they hire an director for me. Um, so it's good, so have me a lot. But, but uh, some of my feelings, as I mentioned about, um, she can't help me a lot because she's not a kidney disease patient. I am. So we go and back, go and back a few times and talking with the doctor and nurse. The results is not really good. Um, so and and passing at that time, uh, it's just uh, really uh, not a very good feeling. So communication, I think, is the most important part. Besides, as mentioned, uh, the doctor told me I need to prepare for diagnosis. At that time, no matter it's hemodiagnosis or peritoneal diagnosis, I don't know what's it because this is the first time for me. So I really worry about it. I worry about what kind of treatment, what kind of thing I need to face. So um, this is also another concern on my side. Uh, lucky that at the same time, my wife, um, after all kind of tests or examinations, um, she's the right people, thanks to God, she's the right people to give her a kidney for me. So, I have a new life. But another point has come out, after the transplant, the post transplant, what kind of treatment, what kind of medications, what kind of activities I need to be care. So this come out for me is another story. I need to have more information. I need to, to 
talk to people, especially to the specialists, especially to the doctors, especially to the nurses and pharmacies like this. I need to have more information. So for, for me, I need to express or to speak out about it. So this is what the patient at that time, or even right now, I face. And besides that, like I'm Chinese, uh, what kind of Chinese considerations when deal with doctors or health professionals, health professionals, this and the, and the kind of story. Um, I say in this way, it's my own understanding is that uh, in Canada, in Vancouver, most Chinese is immigrants from overseas, no matter it's from Hong Kong, mainland China, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, they are all over the world, though the written language is the same. But the, the, the language we speak out is totally different. Cantonese, Mandarin, they are different kind of dialogues. So this is another point uh, we are faced. And also how about their culture, their traditions is totally different. Like for example, Chinese from Indonesia and the Chinese from mainland China, Taiwan is totally different. Their experience, their knowledge is totally different. And same to that, like uh, when you come to Canada or land to Canada, the generation, like for example, you come to Vancouver or Canada is 1950s, like 2000 or even today, 2020. Their experience, their understanding is totally different. So uh, when we're facing to uh, the health professionals, professionals, how to get the right point this is very important. Like immigrants from Europe, French, say for example, from Lithuanian, from British, the, 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 the understanding is totally different. Say to us, we are totally different. So um, this is another point I would suggest it, like uh, need to be understand their background first. And another point is that like Chinese, there's a lot of like traditional preferred medicines. The concept, the treatment is totally different to the Western medicines. And some of them is very helpful, very, very helpful, but of course not on that. So the mutual understanding, especially for the medicine, Herbal medicines and the Western medicine, this is very important, no matter from patient size or from professional size. And since that, like the Chinese acupuncture, Chinese massage, or daily healthy food, is good for body, good for health. But you see, all of them, so we need to study, we need to get more information to the professionals. Say to that, um, professionals need to get time to understanding about it too. This is my suggestion. And besides of that, like uh, Chinese, no matter it's from mainland China, from Malaysia, from Taiwan, same as that, that most of them is family oriented. I can give you a story is that, not story, it is a real, okay. Um, I'm a member of Chinese Window Association, a member, because of the family reasons, he give up all treatments, he give up the transplant. Because the family reasons, of course, we know that it's not an easy going job. So that's why I think uh, this is another important concern. And of course in patient science, but also in how professional select. And the last point I'd like to mention now is that today is already a change, is organ donation. Uh, Chinese Renal Association is a great effort in that. I'm one of the members, I know that. Uh, of course, we are a good sample, my wife and me. My wife is a living donor. Myself is a receiver. We are I would say happy life as the normal. This is very important because we need to educate the Chinese 
And uh, I think the professionals can give us a hand or get some up-to-date information to let the Asian, expect Chinese to know about it. I'm hoping we can have a good uh, result of organ donation. Uh, and not us, um, as a conclusion, I would like to say in that way, a good communication, a good conversation can help health personnel, doctors, specialists, nurses, pharmacists, dietitians, all kind of personnel can let the patient have a good feeling and also understanding their background, their history, and also the patient experience. This is the very important because by the communication with patients, we will get a trust, a confidence, and also, of course, give a good, effective, and efficient treatment. This is very important. Excuse me. It's very important. And uh, the last, I would say that lucky that today we have a lot of support in the community. Like, for example, today is you know give a chance to speak out, to express our feelings. Like for example, like Kidney Foundation of Canada is a new branch, support all kidney diseases patients, no matter if you are local immigrant, they get a lot of support. Same to BC transplant or CKD, they, they all give a good uh, support to the communities. And also the most important that I would say, they also provide a lot of study for sure. Like for example, uh, like this one, uh, wow, hard to see, right? But this is from our Kitty Foundation of Canada, this is a new patch. They give a lot of this kind of brochure. Or even like this Reno, like this one, this kind of, like you can see that what matters to you, they give some support, feeling, and also let us to study what the local community to support us. And the most important nowadays, we got a lot of this, like, for example, like Chinese, they also translate into Chinese, like this time from our Chinese Renewal Association, this from Kidney Foundation, or this one is from this arena, like what matters to you, they translate into Chinese. And that's good for us because Chinese, some of them cannot speak English well or understanding English well, but by the brochure, they can learn it. Like this one, it's a food tree, it's a good sample for us. All the patients need it. So, uh, by all the ways, by the health professionals, doctor, nurse, specialists, uh, like this kind of organization, uh, can help us to fight the kidney diseases. I believe we'll win this war in kidney diseases. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I'm Lois Minfeld, I'm the program manager in Penticton, and I'm thanking you for the opportunity to share with you today from the interior. Uh, the photo you see is from the Kamloops area, the land of the Skwemnik Nation, and I'm, Penticton, I'm in Penticton on the lands of the Silex Nation. I am here representing our whole renal team. The picture that you see, the, the idea of the tree originated with the CKD clinic in Kamloops, and the photographer is actually the program manager in Kamloops. The picture is titled, What Matters to You Matters to Us. And I used the picture and the themes that came out on the stickers as a framework for my thoughts. Can we go to the next slide? So when I looked at the, the top theme was around friends and family. As much as we are part and I am part of a, of a care team around dialysis, there was not a single sticker up there on the on the board that talked about dialysis that talked about you know do we have the right tubing and the right connections no they talked about the themes 
and the biggest theme was friends and family. When we're talking to the clients, you know, it's, it's dialysis is a tool. It gives them the opportunity to be there for their wife, to celebrate their 80th birthday, to make dinners, to take their granddaughter fishing, to go back to work, to attend graduations, weddings. They want to feel well. They want to have time with their families. We get a lot of questions around COVID, around COVID and relationship to friends and family. We can answer those. It became, it was very in, interesting to find out that it really mattered to them that if they came and we did the COVID screening and they needed to be swabbed, that we would do their swab here and they could get their swab results through us as well. Talking to them, the, the ability to travel, to be able to see friends and family has been very important, it has been somewhat compromised in the land of COVID, but it is important that we do what we can to get them so that they feel well and they're able to travel. Another overwhelming thing that really matters is that the discussions of treatment choices always include the family. The transitions of treatment choices, that it is not a one choice only, people flow back and forth between choices depending on what their needs are, what their friends and family needs are. We had one of our spouses who started a dialysis spouse support group. They met during dialysis time, so it was an additional time. They talked about what mattered to them. As she said, no one else understands dialysis life like their spouse. We provided a meeting room. That uh, support group is no longer meeting just because of transitions in their lives. Next slide. Health and happiness, that was the second most common theme on the, the notes. I'm going to just play a little video clip um, and I will let Scott, the gentleman in the picture, tell you a little bit about his perspective. Well, I'm 92. I've been very fortunate to last this long. It sure passes the time. Uh, first uh, hour and a half uh, goes by so fast and then you have a little sleep and then you got about an hour left of the four hour dialysis it just helps but it's so convenient to come in here three times a week and you can pedal for an hour or two hours it's exercise that your legs are getting i guess that you not Can go back so we can go back to the slide so it looks different to everybody staying strong when we first introduced bikes into the dialysis unit we had thought that you know maybe he would bike a short time maybe we would work him up to 15 minutes he's now usually biking an hour and a half to two hours out of every dialysis run it's important to him to stay strong it's important to him to be able to walk his dog, to have more energy. We ask the COVID screening questions every time somebody comes to the unit. We ask the ESAS questions. We use the BC Renal Symptom Management Guides. We have those serious illness conversations to help understand what matters. But then the next step is going beyond that, asking what matters, and then as a team, looking at how we can support them. What does it look like for peace? What does it look like for good health? What does it look like for happiness? And the team has to involve everybody, social work, dietitian, wound care, community nursing, nursing, nephrology, mental health. We just had a an, an time in the Okanagan where we had the Christie Mountain Fire, there, which threatened the evacuation of our hospital. We put in evacuation plans and in those evacuation plans and destinations, we were going to look at spreading people out across the interior health area, and it was going to be significant change for them. People commented to us that knowing that there was plans in place, knowing they had their KX late, knowing what would be happening was also giving them peace of mind during the fire. And there are times that we do have discussions 
and how do people safely manage an abundance of Okanagan fruit? Can we go to the next slide? The third most common topic was pets. Doesn't matter if you're a dog person or a cat person, they matter to you. And there was a lot of laughter about the dog sticker being at the base of the tree. Apparently that was put there on purpose. And like I said, we get comments on people that find, some of them that are starting to bike, that find walking their dog is easier after they've started a biking program. We have St. John's pet visitation that comes into our unit. We did a survey of the, the patients. Were they open to having a dog come in? You know, make sure there was nobody with dog fears, all that kind of stuff. And Charlie, a standard poodle, would come in once or twice a week. And Charlie seemed to know who needed him most that day. And he would rest his head on their leg, usually. And there was lots of times that it was just quietly stroking his head. Charlie's currently on COVID break but he is very sadly missed. One thing that was interesting is during our fire evacuation plans, it included pets. So our patient transport office wasn't quite sure what to do when we gave them transport and evacuation plans for people that involved their spouse and perhaps a pet. We did identify that uh, more people need to have pet carriers at home. We can go to the next slide. So the next slide shows a compilation of themes. So we, we, we ask people what matters to, to them. We have an opportunity for them to put up sticky notes and, and boards. We ask them at the beginning of their dialysis care. Then when we listen to their answers, then we come to the point where what are we doing about it? So this represents a few themes of things that we are doing in our dialysis unit. It is important for, and we've heard over and over, that it is important that as a program, we've been able to support what matters most to them. It matters to have reliable information. And uh, Terence showed some of those examples, including those that are being translated. It's important to have that timely, reliable information. Do we have handouts? Do we have websites? In the time of COVID, do we have in BCCDC, we have the BC Renal handouts. We, people want to know how they and their people can stay healthy during a pandemic. We have clinics. We thought that we would be doing more of our clinics by Zoom, um, but we haven't. We have used phone calls. So people can reach out, they can, there's not a, a barrier with the phone usually, but there have been some barriers with Zoom. So we've been using most of our phone calls for clinics. The mask is there to represent having a COVID safety plan. So all of the units have developed COVID safety plans. People need to feel safe when they come in. They need to know what they can do to maintain their safety and what we can do to provide safe care for them. The car represents several things. So the car rep represents going down to the parking lot to meet the Kidney Foundation volunteer who had sewed 35 fabric masks for our, our client base when there was a time when visitors weren't allowed in the hospital. The car represents the client who's hesitant to come into the building. So we have been going to the parking lot and giving him his ARNS in his car. So that's what matters to him. It matters to him that he gets the medication he needs, but it also matters to him that it is done where he feels safe to get it. The car also represents and ties into the cloud with the silver lining. During this time of, of change and of COVID, we've been able to put in place that when people are needing vascular surgery, they can have their pre-surgical screening and their initial surgeon visit done over the phone. In the interior, transportation to and from the Kelowna for a vascular site is a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge. And during COVID, we've now got it so that they can do one trip versus three. The next slide. So our board, our tree is still growing. I actually 
because it was a few days that this this developing of this presentation took place there's more sticky notes up on our tree we can't leave the sticky notes in the pans all stacked out there because it all has to be wiped down and sanitized but our tree is still growing and no doubt it will change over time but what doesn't matter or what doesn't change is that what matters to you as our client population matters to us thank you Thanks very much for that, Lois. Hello. Uh, Hello, my name is Janice. I'm one of the managers on the South Island of Vancouver Island, uh, the territory of the Esquimalt and um, Coast Salish people. I have to admit I'm not very good at pronunciation, so I'm not going to um, pronounce what language they speak, um, and I obviously do not speak their language, So, but I am super grateful to be living on their lands. Um, I just wanted to, uh, the presentation from Island Health is a little bit different. Um, we really uh, wanted to make sure that what matters to you was ingrained um, within the department. Um, we realized that all the staff are really very sensitive and what matters to our patients really matters to them. What matters to our staff and our patients really manage, matters to the leadership team. So we really wanted to make sure that it was very evident and in writing within our department. So our presentation is a little bit more around that. Um, next slide, please. Um, we started the work Next slide. Um, we started the work around um, really um, making sure our patient engagement framework was well documented so everyone in the department could see it. Um, I have to admit with COVID, we haven't um, done a really big rollout of it, um, but we have been working hard over the last year to two years on what our patient engagement framework looks like. Um, everybody can read it there, um, but really um, the picture says it all. Uh, the very center of our patient framework is the patient. Um, all the little things sticking out the side, um, those are the principles around um, what we would like um, every interaction with our patients and our staff to look like. Um, and the circles around it are the different ways that we can make that happen. So through point of care, um, through program and service redesign and strategic planning. And the very outer um, ring is our island health um, principles, our, which is courage, aspire, respect and empathy. And um, the acronym for that is CARE. So we really wanted to make sure that it was um, really representative of our program and that it's weaving throughout the whole program. Next slide, please. Um, you can see um, the patient engagement standards um, are within those three rings um, that I showed you before, the point of care program and service co-design and strategic planning. Um, and it kind of gives a little bit of a sense around what each of those look like and what they mean. Um, and we have lots of different examples of different things that we do in each of those um, different areas, but um, I won't go into all the details um, with you guys on that. Um, but just kind of what we've been working on. Next slide, please. Part of the way we can weave it in within our whole department is we really wanted to make sure that um, our patients have a voice as well as our staff have a voice. So we added the what matters to you question on our hemodialysis run sheets um, in order to make it a part of our everyday care. Um, not only to make it a part of our everyday care, but also to be able to share with other people um, that are working within the department around what really matters to the patient. Um, I, we haven't done a full audit to find out how well it's being filled out or we haven't really pushed it very much, but there are definite um, comments on it. Um, we want to make it more of a friendly type of an approach rather than a you have to do this type of a thing um, because then it becomes more formalized rather than a very, um, I don't know the word that I'm looking for, like a, a that people are truly meaning what they're asking patients. Um, so we have the ability to share it with our staff. Um, when I walk down into the department and walk around, I can hear um, patients and nurses talking and I know the, the conversations are happening. We wanted to find a way that it was really easy for everyone to know what matters to our patients um, at any given time. And that's through our hemodialysis run sheets. Uh, next slide, please. 
We have, um, we have many opportunities um, for our patients to give us feedback. Um, we started a patient experience feedback um, type of a scenario within all of our waiting rooms with a little box um, that looked like a home um, that had a patient experience card on it. And we heard from our patients that at times they felt a little bit uncomfortable pre-COVID, um, sitting in the waiting room, filling out the box and having other patients and staff members potentially seeing them putting a card in the box, it made them feel a little bit uncomfortable, especially if there was a negative comment on there or what they perceived as a negative comment. Um, so what we have done is we've changed the card to make it um, more generic, as well as um, we're doing a trial within our in-center units to actually hand out the card um, to our patients um, so that they have the opportunity to fill it out if they want to and then just leave it there and then we'll collect them at the end so they have the ability to give us feedback through the boxes if they want as well as um, give us feedback while they're doing their dialysis run so that loses that um, sense that they're being watched or being judged by filling out a card. Next slide please. Um, within the department, um, we really wanted to give people um, the opportunity to say what matters to them. Um, and we've done it both for our patients and our staff. So we've dedicated a couple walls in the department. Um, this one is our patient wall and it isn't very full yet, but it's getting there. Um, and we just laminated some um, signs with COVID screening has given us a very um, easy way for us to ask that question and giving patients the opportunity if they want to, um, they can let us know what matters to them. Um, fill out the, the form if they want and have the opportunity to have it shown in the department. Again, it's not a forced thing. If people want to do it, they are more than welcome to. And if they don't, they don't have to. One of the reasons why we wanted it posted in the department was not only for our patients to see, but also for our staff to see that it's important um, to know what really matters to our patient. Um, and like what was said earlier, um, you can tell that um, what really matters to patients is their family um, and their lives outside of dialysis. Not once does it say dialysis on there. Um, so it's a really good reminder for everyone that um, our patients have a voice and they have things that matter to them that are very similar to what matters to our staff in the department. Next slide, please. Um, we also really thought it was important um, that we're doing all this work to make sure that our patients' uh, voices are heard, um, that our staff voices are heard too. So um, we have a wall dedicated to staff around what matters to them. Um, and it's near the waiting room so patients can also see it um, and see what matters to the staff um, within the department. Um, and in the COVID times, we felt that it was equally important for our patients and anyone who is entering the department to be able to see our staff and the people who are caring for them's full faces without being hidden behind a mask and gown and all that stuff that's happening. Um, so we've gotten a lot of really good feedback actually from it, from both staff and patients around um, being able to see what matters um, the most to people um, that work within the department. Um, next slide, please. We also um, thought that it was really important, um, despite everything that's been written um, and despite everything that's being shown, to actually model the behavior. Um, it's easy to say one thing, but do another. And people actually listen to your actions more than words, as we all know. Um, so the I have a couple um, examples up there of our doors. Um, the first one there, um, Robin is our director. So she has put up a sign on her door around what matters to her. Um, and every single meeting um, that is hosted by our director starts with the question of what matters to you and let's make sure that it's on the agenda and that it's, um, that it's addressed within that meeting. So we've all started to really change the way we talk and find out what matters to people before we actually dive into what matters to us personally, um, especially when it comes to meetings and stuff like that. Um, the next question, the next picture there is a copy of my door. Um, I put up the sign as well around what matters to you. Um, and for me, it's finding ways to support um, both patients and staff. And I think um, what matters to you is a perfect example of that. And I see we're getting very close on time. So that is my very fast presentation. Um, at Island Health, we definitely are 
interested in what matters and um, we're trying really hard to make it um, ingrained within our whole department uh, by not only having it in writing but um, having examples of it throughout our department. Thank you. So thanks very much uh, all of you for great presentations and I think it is important especially in this time of COVID that we are even more uh, tuned in to asking and listening and doing. Uh, I really commend all of you for truly socializing um, and, and taking to heart and making it uh, throughout. I think all of us try and I think the examples that you've given in the different locations of modeling the what matters to you are really inspiring. So thank you. I'm just wondering if there are any questions or comments that uh, people would like to make. Uh, there are 57 people uh, on the call on the uh, Zoom, which is fantastic. As you know, it's been recorded, so it will go into the archives, etc. But um, any questions that people have or comments? One of the things is perhaps um, you could. What's it like to having these conversations with masks on? <laughs> Like, I find that this is one of the sort of things that we're all struggling with is trying to keep our humanity in our interactions with people at the same time as having a lot of physical cues that say that you don't want to see or hear or do. So I'd be interested in your perspectives on, on that. Maybe Lois from the front lines, you could... Um, being a smaller program, um, it is, it is a little bit, we have, for, with a lot of our, with a lot of our, uh, our persons living with kidney disease, we, we, we've had that relationship with them over time. So the, the presence of masks has not been unfamiliar in the setting. The duration of the mask wearing is what's new and different. Um, so the, but masks are definitely becoming part of the social norm as well, not just in the medical setting. So you do your best. You ask the questions, um, being very aware of voice and intonation as well um, when you can't see. Um, I've heard the comment that people talk a lot more with their eyes than they used to. Um, people are more aware of, of eye expressions, eyebrow movement, things like that, so that you can you can still generate the emotion without the visibility of the of the mouth. Great, thanks. Other questions that people have? We are coming close to the bottom of the hour, so to speak. Uh, I'm just going to look in the um, chat box. Um, Teresa thanked everyone for the amazing work and Paul um, is saying that connecting patient to patient is helpful in discussing and finding what matters to you. So thanks for that, Paul. And Adira, it's Cassie. I just wondered if I could add in to what Lois is saying because sure. Ricky and I at the council, we're actually developing a resource specifically aimed at how healthcare partners can still continue to build relationships and trust with their patients in light of having to wear personal protective equipment. So I, I'm hoping that we can say watch this space because very shortly we'll have a resource that kind of, we've researched some of the literature and, and practices out there and what seems to be working. And it sort of taps into sort of certain themes related to nonverbal communication and mindfulness, and then sort of the verbal communication tying into sort of the importance of introductions, acknowledging the PPE, making it a human interaction, um, just keeping patients really informed of the process, and then sort of some of the written and digital solutions that might help for those who might be sort of hearing impaired that would have typically been lip reading, but now they can't because you're in a mask. So I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks- I would, I would say, I'd like to see some masks with, um plastic so that you can watch people's lips i mean that... those, those do exist they are they are out there so that is an innovative solution to this yeah. right to have those clear masks 
So yeah, I just wanted to sort of add that in quickly before we wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for putting the time and thoughtfulness into the presentations, but mostly um, for sharing so honestly with us what matters to you.